Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to the Bayside Council Chambers. My name is Ty Snape, and today we're doing something a bit different and doing a live stream with our artist Ponch Hawks. And we're actually in front of Ponch's work here, which was commissioned for the Chambers, and it's called Changing Faces. And it's, I'm actually not going to explain what it is, I'm going to hand over to Ponch, but first I'm going to ask just tell me a little bit about the work, but also what was your brief for this work? Uh, my brief for this work was a visit here to the council chambers with the council staff from the gallery, and they suggested that they would like to apply for some money from that wonderful organisation, Pick Health, which has a very broad view of health, and that they wanted to do something about gender equity because these funds were available to explore that. So I came back a week or so later with two ideas, uh, and the first idea, nobody's face lit up. Oh, <laughs> that's never good. And then the second idea, which was to photograph uh, the women from Bayside, women and girls from Bayside wearing beads and moustaches, everybody thought that was a fantastic idea. So that was how we went about it. My brief was um, to talk about gender equity or to, uh, to, for a show that would deal with that. And that's the way I dealt with it. And was it to respond directly to this space? Uh, absolutely. Right. Uh, um, this space is, it's, it's solemn and it's, you know, traditional and it's full of gravitas and weight and decisions are made here. And when you come in and you see all these photographs of 170 photographs of men, mostly with beards and moustaches, um, you know, it's a different look from what it looks like now with the 170 women in it. And did that strike you as straight away when you came into the space that it was male heavy? Well, I, I, it, it just seemed kind of a bit ridiculous <laughs> and absurd to me that here we are, 2020, and we have an exhibition in the council chambers of women of Bayside and of the mayors of Bayside, and only 11 of, 11 of them have been women. And so the women that you've photographed in this exhibition aren't just councillors, they're also other, they're girls as well. So where did those women come from? Well, they're, they're, they're self-chosen really. They, um, the council put out a, a, um, a little story about the exhibition and asked for people to apply. So people applied uh, from all sorts of aspects of the community or for all sorts of different reasons. You know, one because they would be proud to be in the council chambers or because they were the captain or you know ran 14 sporting clubs or they were active in historical house or they were uh, you know uh, promoted by their headmistress because they were doing well at school or being great volunteers so what it actually brought up was a lot of people who were proud of being in the community and who wanted to be in the show that's fantastic so it's like self-nominated self appearance yeah and then were there some that were asked to be in it as well or they were all right possibly i don't actually know that um but some people were asked to be ambassadors so i suppose they were asked to be in it you know that and there were a lot of those were women in quite um powerful positions in society generally and probably if they hadn't been asked may not have gone in because they may just have been too busy yeah so in terms of the technical aspect of the work they're all black and white photographs but were they shot in black and white film no no they're all shot digitally in color okay mm -hmm. and were they shot in the space or in a studio i made a little pop-up studio actually in the uh, committee rooms council committee rooms mm -hmm. and um yeah and everybody was in the same situation so they they came in, we talked to them, expl explained again what we were doing, showed our array of moustaches, beards, and moustaches on sticks, and then people chose something or not, because you, you, you're quite at liberty to not uh, choose to wear one. And then they came in to me and I took their photograph. So I guess coming from that, the idea with the um, moustaches and beards, and the, I like that there was an arrangement, like a, an array of them, not just one. You could choose your oh, type no, of I beard. I should tell you the story, which is that I was working on a, on a show in Amsterdam, a show called Sex and Death, and there was a $2 shop across the road, Dutch $2 shop, so, yeah, so organised. And I went in there and I saw all these moustaches and beards, and we, as yet, we hadn't had the grand proof, so we didn't have the money. But I thought, well, I'm going to bet we're going to get it. And I, so I spent 50 euros. Oh, fantastic. So they're not just any. Like, no, they're that's from right. Amsterdam. And also I got some wonderful ones in Shepparton. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Shepparton's good for that. Yeah, stuff, yeah. Isn't it? And so with the moustaches and beards, I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you think 
ideas of humour can actually operate or play with serious ideas of gender equity? Sure, I think you know humour can can do it. Sort of kind of relieve stress. It can make people more relaxed, um, or not, because um, I think that so people still hold to this idea of um, women aren't funny, uh, <laughs> despite the evidence of dozens and dozens of women at the comedy festival doing shows and um, female comedians being very successful in shows on TV. Um, and actually, I read a really interesting thing in Harvard Business Review. I thought I'd read it regularly, but I happened to see this article which said that uh, they compared men, a group of men and a group of women giving presentations, and both of those groups used humour ah. in their presentation. And um, the uh, men would, were, were marked down as being, you know, showing you know, incapable of leadership and good thinking and so on and so on, and the women were marked down for using humour. So <laughs> I would have to say it's a very ambiguous uh, sort of area. You know, what's funny to you about funny to me? Yeah, and I guess just playing, I mean, with that idea of ser the seriousness of, of gender equ equity or feminism is often seen as this kind of staunch, stuffy, you know, and I think as feminists we struggle with that a little bit because you don't want to be labelled as, you know, stuffy or angry or no. whatever <laughs> feminists get called all the well, time. I mean, the way I thought about this was I thought it was playful. Yeah. And I thought that would, would people would find it easier to think about it in those kind of terms because it is playful for grown-up women or even grown-up children to be wearing beards and moustaches. That's fun, you know. Yeah, and were there any women that found it uncomfortable? Yes. And how did you, I mean, how did that go for you? That would be difficult as an artist to... Uh, well, uh, I had, I thought I just had several options. I had uh, beards, various sizes, moustaches, many sizes, I also had moustaches on sticks. I so, saw that. I like yeah. them very elegant. Yeah. yeah, people. Some people didn't want to put anything on their face, mm. um, uh, or because I've worn their makeup, yeah. or they just didn't want to put anything on their face. Some people flat out wouldn't uh, engage with it, mm. but still wanted to be in the council chambers in the show. And so I respected all of those ideas. Um, everybody was entitled to do what they felt comfortable with. I love it. I, I kind of like the idea that maybe you could follow it up with a series of the, the male council members wearing dresses or perhaps <laughs> ponytails. No, ponytails, perhaps. <laughs> You'd have to speak to the councillors about that. And I do think, I mean, that, that sort of idea of a gender stereotype is quite interesting. It's something you've followed through in your work for quite a long time. Um, your very first show, am I right? Us and Our Mums. Our Mums and Us. Our Mums and Us, mm. which was photographs of... Um, young women and their mums in the 70s? My peer group, yeah. Your peer my, group. My friends. And so that, for me, when I looked at that series, looked at sort of ideas of stereotypes of not just age between a, two generations, but of class and how that can change within a, a generation almost. Mm. So, and this is looking at stereotypes of, you know, men in power, I guess, or women in power. And you've also done another show that's actually opening now in 2020, 2020. 2021 um, and it was about to open now which sadly I mean like a lot of shows have shut but it was called or it is called Flesh After 50 500 Strong. Do you want to tell us a bit about that project and how that um, busts stereotypes as well? Well um, it, 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 it's 500 up to 500 photographs of women over 50 naked uh, and they were encouraged they could bring a prop so you didn't, they could be anonymous and um, I also uh, went to regional areas to Geelong and Shepparton to do that work. And basically, if you um, Google um, you know, women over 50 naked, the only thing, you would two clicks you onto granny porn, and that's all that exists because there are hardly any images of um, women over 50 naked. That's amazing. Because people don't find it an interesting idea. Um, and yeah. And so it plays into that I, that that trope, or not trope, but the thing that happens is that we become invisible. I actually think it starts when you have children, <laughs> and then progressively seems to get stronger. It absolutely plays into that idea about being invisible, and that idea plays into your ideas of health and self worth mm. and, and self regard, um, because women's health is really dependent on how they feel about themselves, you know, and how they can look after themselves. And, and if you're invisible and if you're ignored and you don't, e don't even know what you look like and you don't even know what your friends look like because you don't see other people naked very frequently. Mm. And so you could think, oh, I don't look like I looked when I was 28. 
but you know, not that we're ripped as anybody else, you know, but that's your image, that's your stereotype of what you should look like. Because, you know, it's a, and, and it's cliche to say we live in a youth oriented society, however we do. And so people think they need to look a lot younger than they actually are, generally. Yeah, I think it happens throughout our lives, probably from when we're about 15 and on. Mm-hmm. But I, I think with this work, what's interesting is that you're adopting, you know, the male facial hair. Or, I mean, we should actually say that some women do also have moustaches and some female identifying mm. people do, you know, because now we're at a point where in, you know, gender theory, where facial hair doesn't always discriminate between. That's correct. So... You know, with bodies, I guess you're looking at what's underneath, but here it's almost like you're layering on top. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's saying, look, this is nothing. Look at this is all it is, you know. I mean, in this um, area, it's quite a very fairly old, old um, uh, age group and it's also very well off. And there are women in this series who are CEOs and who run all sorts of large organisations like, you know, Ken Football Clubs or, you know, um, they've got kids at home and they still run a social change organisation or their kids who are at school were volunteering as well as looking mm. after their family. It's a huge range of people, incredible wealth of talent. Mm. And yet only one, there's only one woman councillor. Wow. And in fact, it's gone back since the 80s. Oh, I assumed there was more. No, there's one woman councillor currently um, and there were female mayors in previous decades but not currently um and in some ways this is a project about saying well you know you, you can be in local government everybody who had their photograph taken got a score to around these council chambers mm. they got a feel for how it would would feel to be in here and to see what it was because probably nobody goes to a council meeting not very many people um so we, we tried to, to ask that, and we asked people to fill in the survey also before and afterwards about how they felt about local government. And there was a really a very positive response to um, thinking about standing for local government because mm. local government's a training ground for, you know, state government or other organisations being on a board. And, being the Prime Minister. Yeah, <laughs> that was what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's something that girls and young girls need to be told, don't they, that that's an option. Mm. And even though you might just be the captain of the netball club at the moment, you could sit in local council and then move on and have a talent. Yeah, mm. and maybe within schools, do you think that's identified? I, I wonder. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't hang around schools, so I, I don't know. But it is interesting that by just by the act of placing an artwork in the space, it, it not only makes them aware that they could be here, but the people sitting in council aware that all of these women are out there in their community, mm, mm. that they could also call upon mm. even, mm. and that have a sense of humour. Mm. It's fantastic. Mm. Uh, what else was I going to say? I, you told me just before we came on air that you have another really interesting body of work you're about to unveil. You've been pretty busy lately. Yeah, I have been. <laughs> Could you tell us about the upcoming show at Monash? Yes, it's actually up on the website. And it's called The Ties That Bind and it's the Monash Gallery of Art, which is largely a, a very large photographic gallery in Australia, I think. And they commissioned four artists um, to do some work and I was one of them and I chose to do uh, homeless women um, in the suburbs. So they're all actually uh, reconstructed photographs. So I interviewed a lot of people uh, from all sorts of organisations and women who had been homeless and who were homeless, and then came up with a series of photographs which all have texts that accompany them. And they're very interesting show, I think. And I didn't, I, I was a bit, mm, have I done well enough here? It was a terribly difficult job mm. um, to do. And then it's had a really extraordinary response, actually. It's been terrific. How many women did you photograph? Uh, well, I, I didn't photograph. There's no, no women. There's oh. no people in the oh, photographs okay. because you're homeless. Or you've been you homeless. Yeah, it's yeah. a shame job. Yeah. You don't need to be photographed for that. You know, It's their presence which I photograph. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm. And, I mean, people leave things behind, don't they? So mm. their presence in a, in a space. Mm, mm, oh, mm. I can't wait to see that. Mm, I'll have to have look, look that up. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Maybe mm. we can put a link to that show as mm. well mm. afterwards. Uh I, actually, one question I wanted to ask you, and don't take offence, but like the difference in our in our age is that you've been practicing for a lot longer than I have, and as a practicing artist, we and as a woman, I think we think a lot about our legacy and what we leave behind or what we're trying to say. 
did you, when you first started your career, did you have an idea of what that legacy, what you wanted that to be? Or is that something that's happened over time? Oh, I had no idea about what a practice was or what a legacy was or anything or that I was an artist. Um, really, I just, um, I just was doing things because I was interested in them. And that's always the advice I give to young artists, which is engage with something that you care about. Um, and so I've done this. I made a list before I came, actually. I quite shocked myself about how many topics I'd sort of covered in uh, yeah, my Uber, if you like. Um, but I did them all because I was really interested in them. And the thing about it is, is that um, lots of things I've done, nobody else has been interested. So I've, I've been the first person to tackle them. So probably I'm better known than some other people because they're very fat. Mm. And the fact is that they're about women and people weren't particularly interested in that aspect of women's lives or thought they were important enough to, to chronicle or deal with or examine. So that's my legacy. And coming out of the 70s, I guess, there were lots of women. I mean, Jermaine Greer, was that was her time too, for mm -hmm. obvious reasons, mm -hmm. similar reasons, I mm -hmm. guess. But did you identify then with that movement of, you know, women's liberation or of feminism back then? Yes, yes, I did. Um, not, I remember going along and knitting at a meeting. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> um, I really engaged with it more when I went to the States. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in the States for a couple of years. And when I came back, you know, I had my badge, you know, I was ready to go, ready to, you know, go for it. Yeah. And that's not changed throughout throughout the eras that you've worked? No, no, it hasn't. I mean, you know, when you get to my age, you used to know that you will be unfashionable sometimes. Oh, you know? that's a really good thing to say because it's so true, isn't it? It, it is yeah. absolutely true. And you know, your time will come around. And I, I love it when older artists or middle career artists, suddenly there's a young curator. Because cu curators now have so much sway, yeah. um, uh, I, I love it when they revive the work, they see it again. You know? And it's also the thing of it, you, you see everything reinvented. You see, yeah. and so when you see something that is new, it really grabs you or way, a way that you hadn't thought about it before, it's fabulous. But it does make, I think with time and perspective, it makes your earlier works, it gives them you know this longevity or you know timelessness that we do keep revisiting those ideas and mainly because the work's not done yet right mm, that's right well look at this yeah yeah it's not done um here and here i am you know 45 years later probably doing similar things that, that i was doing back then yeah which is quite shocking really isn't it it is shocking and when i was talking about this work with someone you know i said well, why do they need to wear moustaches and and he actually said well because the still still a powerful man's world and we still need to be making that comment but i wish we didn't need to. <laughs> well i think that um if we just had the portraits straight mm -hmm. um that they just wouldn't have garnered the same kind of attention the fact that people are wearing beads and moustaches and that's in some sense as mild as it might be controversial mm -hmm. you know it makes people engage with the work more yeah and that's sort of what it's about isn't it making people look at the work mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're women mm -hmm. and it's kind of commonplace to just overlook a picture of a woman right. still mm -hmm. <laughs> unless they're naked mm -hmm. or famous <laughs> yes. well i think we've covered most things but would, do we have any questions from the audience oh we do this is exciting sorry please excuse me i've never done this before so is this being recorded yes uh ponch is so insightful i agree can you point out the questions do we have questions or do we just need to read the comments we can just say the comments. Oh, Haley says we're really looking forward to seeing the exhibition in real life. Well, we can see a lot of it here now, but yeah. it goes actually all the way around, which is pretty impressive. Helen says, how did you find working with the various members of the community? So maybe I could interpret that the various members as in like different types of people. Well, I think I'm sort of covered it if we, you know, earlier mm -hmm. to say that um, people entered into the project for different reasons, I think. And so um, the way they approached it, me, the way I approached them was different as well. I think some people wanted to advertise something they were connected with and other people wanted to um, explain how extremely proud they were of something that they had done or some organisation that they'd been involved in. I think there were many reasons that people um, got involved in the project. Were there any language barriers? Were there any new um, new Australians or people that couldn't speak English? Uh, there was nobody who couldn't speak English. There were some new uh, arrivals 
who spoke perfect English, actually. Yeah. One saw in gorgeous one that I remember. remember. Mm. Which is great. I mean, I think it, that's always a difficult thing is to not just represent. I mean, with feminism now, it's not just about representing no. gender, it's about representing all different mm. types of people that are in minority. So mm. well done for casting the net. Mm. That's, the, mm. that's a hard thing. What else have we got here? Is this, I know, I've already read that. Um, if restrictions are partially lifted, will there be an opportunity to see the exhibition by appointment? Uh, I, I believe so. The original idea was that uh, it would be open to the public on Saturdays and Sundays. Now that was pre-COVID, so I can't, um, I, I really don't know the answer to that. You really depend on how events unfold. How long does it stay up for? Uh, I, that's unclear too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everything's unclear now, isn't yeah. it? It's like the new normal. Yes. We don't know. Uh, okay. What else? A great legacy from Linda. That's nice. So you've already done it. You could just stop now. But you're not going to stop, are you? You're no, going to keep going. Um, Marlene says, you are so grounded, Ponch. Um, John says, staunch, which is a nice compliment. Can we take that as a backhand mm, compliment? Absolutely. Mm. Um, Tim it says... It's like in the, in the <laughs> that word? That's what I'd like to be, in the <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> tough, <laughs> staunch. I'll read that in the same... <laughs> Um, Tim says, what was the most inspiring story that you heard from a participant? Mm, gee, um, I'd have to, I probably need a little bit of time to reflect on it because personally I had the biographies mm. but I didn't get a lot of time to actually explore those um, because we were, you know, showing them through. Um, great, great um, um story from an Iranian teacher. She, she was absolutely wonderful. I really loved her. And a couple of artists who were really uh, also quite dynamic. And give me the beard. You know, they were great. Excellent. <laughs> give me two beards. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Oh, and the one who took the eyebrows. That wasn't a story, but it was a oh. visual story. Oh, oh eyebrows would have been great. I'll <laughs> yeah, have to find that one afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Ellen has asked, oh, maybe this is a statement. I was so lucky and honoured you have done my year 11 work experience with or to have done my year 11 work experience with you many years ago it's ponch it's thanks to you that before I, I take any pictures I ask myself questions as to their meanings etc thank oh, you so that's yeah. nice isn't yeah. it you've, you've added to someone else's mm, ongoing legacy. Mm. um uh, what else I loved the image used with the woman and her dog oh, yes is there a dog in there there certainly is and, and every time you said the dog's name, it looked up. It was great. Oh, it's a poodle, and I'm a poodle owner and lover. I love so. that a dog was allowed in. That's <laughs> dog fantastic. Dog and baby came too. Yeah. Um, Jenny's asked, can Ponch talk about her 50 nude women exhibition? I think we did that. And yeah. when will that happen? Do we know an exact date? Exactly, March the twen uh, March two two twenty at the Abbotsford two twenty one at the Abbotsford Convent. Oh, great. Um, yes, they've. Repurposed the whole Magdalen laundry. Oh, that's a fantastic space. Isn't that's it? right. And the backstory is my father worked there for 35 years. So there's another wow. aspect to the story for me. And so my work's going to be over 20 metres, and there are eight other artists. It's a great show. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Patrick Pound. And, oh, I love Patrick uh, Pound yeah, as well. Oh, I can't wait. All sorts of people. Oh, Actually, that'll be great. And you just completely went Ruth Madison. Yeah. And you said Shepparton as Evans. well? Uh, well, there's some talk that'll go to um, Shepparton and Geelong. Um, the whole show can't go; it's too big. But yeah, it's quite some quite big videos as well. So we've got a lot. We've got. We'll have a lot of chances to see that work. So oh, don't worry. So, yeah. We haven't missed it. I, I'm dying to see it myself. <laughs> <laughs> how did you decide how many women you were going to photograph from Janet in this from this exhibition? Yeah, it was everybody who applied. Oh, everybody who asked to be in it is in it. So that's very democratic. Yeah. And it just happened to perfectly fit in this space. Yeah, well, I, I, I wasn't very in the QA. I didn't have it. Um, well, that's pretty And they probably fortunate. wouldn't have fitted in the space if I had to do it. But whoever did it did a good job. They did do a good job. It looks like it's made because that's the space, what it required. Yeah. Uh, Lauren has asked, what was the age range of women photographed? That's, a, that's actually quite an important question. I think the youngest person was about eight. And the oldest person, it's a former mayor actually, who's in the 90s. I hope she won't mind me saying, I think she was 94. Oh, I think I spotted her. Yeah, I'm there holding her little moustache in front yeah, of her face. Yeah, with a big smile. Yeah. Well, mm. she'd be, she would love to see this, yeah. I'm sure. Mm. How mm. proud would you be mm. to watch mm. that unfold? Uh, and I think that's all our questions. So 
If we're done here, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you today. <laughs> and I feel like it's given me a real insight into, you know, just your practice, but also where things come from, which is always lovely to hear from, from artists. So thank you so much. And on behalf of our audience, thanks mm, for thank you. taking the time. I don't know if I was meant to look at your audience <laughs> or not, but I didn't. I looked at the tie. I hope that's okay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>